Good morning, good morning. Why don't you please turn in the Word of God to 1 Samuel chapter 15, page 248 in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let's just take a moment to pray and then we'll look into the Word together. Lord, thank you for this precious book that you have entrusted to us. Thank you that your word in both the Old and New Testament is inspired by you and our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Gracious God, by your Holy Spirit, speak to us through your word. Help us to get to know you. Amen. At a point in the reign of King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, a vote of no confidence was discussed in the assembly of the Trinity. Saul's performance was measured against the rights and duties of kingship, and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were in full agreement that he deserved to be rejected as the king of Israel. No secret ballot was necessary because they were all on the same page, unanimous in their decision. And Samuel, the faithful prophet that years earlier had been appointed to anoint Saul as the king of Israel, Samuel was given the task of conveying heaven's decision to King Saul. And 1 Samuel 15 is the account of that most difficult, that most dramatic confrontation that we find anywhere in the pages of Holy Scripture. It's a blow-by-blow account of the hard talk that Samuel had with Saul. It was hard for Samuel to give, And it would have been hard for Saul to receive. And that's what we have in front of us this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 15. We have here a confrontation by a broken-hearted leader. Of course, the confrontation we have here is unique. It's unrepeatable. It's a historical event that happened and is never going to happen again. But it has lessons and principles for us as we seek to live our lives as disciples of the Lord Jesus. And so this morning, I want us, it's rather a long chapter, 35 verses in all. Could we have a bit more light? It seems a bit, uh, yeah, there we go. I want to see the eyes of the people in the back row. Okay, I can see you. Good. It's a, it's a, it's a longish chapter, but there's some key lessons that I want us to, to see and to not miss bearing in mind that all Scripture is God-breathed, breathed out by God and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God, the woman of God can be equipped for every good work. So the first lesson I want to draw to your attention is this, that God's commands are always clear, just, and for our good. Let's read the command God gave to King Saul through the prophet Samuel, beginning in verse one. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go, Attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. That God's command to Saul was clear is beyond dispute. God told him very simply, 
very specifically what he was to do. No room for misunderstanding, no room for misinterpretation. He was to attack the Amalekites and he was to destroy everything. That was the command, totally clear. But then secondly, this command was also just. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking the same thing as my wife thought After reading these chapters in her quiet time this morning, she read chapters 13, 14, and 15. And as I came out of the shower, she was drying her hair, and uh, she said, really seemed like it was pretty harsh what God required Saul to do to the Amalekites. And I said, you have just articulated what everybody in the congregation is going to be thinking when we read those verses. And that's what you're thinking, right? That is pretty harsh. I mean, especially the children and infants bit. It doesn't sound like these could be the words of a God who, Scripture says, has compassion on all that he has made. How can this be the word of God? It's horrid. Well, first of all, it is horrid. Let's admit that. It's horrid. Second, our claim is only that Scripture is true. Our claim is not that Scripture is sanitized and nice. And then thirdly, the Lord's vengeance should not be rejected but praised, provided it is just vengeance. So the Lord contends that his vengeance against Amalek is just because, if you look at verse 2, because of what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. As the Israelites came came across the Red Sea into the, before they even got to Mount Sinai, the Amalekites attacked them. You remember it was this company of, could have been up to two million people Men, women, children, animals, all their belongings, they'd come out of Egypt, they were on their way to the promised land. They were unarmed because they had been slaves in Egypt, not soldiers. And the Amalekites came and they attacked them from behind. They attacked the the stragglers, they attacked the ones who were weak. They hadn't heard about the Geneva Convention. And Moses Remember that dirty attack. And in Deuteronomy chapter 25, he said this. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on the journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. And for that, Amalek was to be wiped out. Verse 19, when the Lord your God gives you the rest, gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land he's giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. That was God's instruction through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Now you're sitting here thinking, well, I mean, that was a long time ago. Why should the descendants of those who attacked the Israelites when they came out of Egypt, why should they suffer for what their ancestors did? But I want you to note that Samuel refers to the current generation of Amalekites in this chapter as wicked, as sinners. And he announces King Agag's war crimes in verse 33 as the basis for his execution. And so the slaughter of the the Amalekites represents a fully justified action on the part of a holy God who reserves the right at any point in history to bring judgment on sin. And the fact that this this command came from God means that it is a priori, just. For what does God's word say? Will not the judge of all the earth do right? That's got to be a foundational principle of the character of God. 
Genesis 18, verse 25. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And, and again and again, where I'm, when I'm confronted with things that I don't understand, mysteries, I come back and I rest on that rock-solid principle of God's character. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? I say, Lord, I don't understand that, but what I do know, what I do know is that the judge of all the earth will do right. And so this command was just. And then thirdly, God's commands are always for our good. The Amalekites posed a serious threat to both the security and the morality of Israel. And God, in judging them, was protecting and preserving his people and also providing an example to us that is both, on the one hand, a warning we need to know that God is a God who judges, but also an encouragement. Because as we see some of the horrific things that are happening in our day, I watched a documentary on the BBC last night about ISIS and about some of the things that ISIS has been doing in Syria and Iraq now that they've been defeated in Mosul and are just about defeated in Raqqa. People are now talking about what life has been like under ISIS and when I hear those stories, when we hear stories of the girls who were captured by, uh, kidnapped by Boko Haram, and some of them have been released now up in northern Nigeria, and we're hearing stories of what happened to them, I am so grateful that we serve a God who judges, and who judges justly. So God's commands are always clear just and for our good. The Ten Commandments that we are subject to, the Ten Commandments, were not invented by a God who sat there thinking, Who, what, what ten things can I, do to, can I make these people do to make their lives miserable? The Ten Commandments are given because God knows that it's in obeying those commands that we will find life and experience life as it should be. And the other commands of God that apply generally to us, are the same. They're clear, they're just, and they're ultimately for our good. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two, God's commands have a way of revealing what is in our hearts. Uh, what is in your heart? What is, what is your, your deep down attitude toward God? Nothing reveals that more clearly than the way we respond to the commands of God. You remember in Romans chapter 7, the apostle Paul wrote, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? In other words, is there something wrong with God's commands? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, he says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. How come? He goes on and he explains, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. And he goes on and says that the law had a way of showing him his heart, of bringing out what was really in his heart in relation to God, showing him his need of God and the fact that he couldn't keep that law in his own strength. The rich young ruler, for example, you remember you remember the story of the rich young ruler. He, he thought he was, a, he was pretty cool. He was fine with God. He was a good guy, kept all the rules. And then Jesus, uh, he comes to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know, keep the rules. And he says, oh, I've done that, kept all the rules. And then Jesus says, um, by the way, why don't you, if you want to follow me, go and sell all your possessions and give them to, give them to the poor and then come and follow me. And that instruction of Jesus found him out. He loved his possessions more than he was prepared to love and follow Jesus. And so the command showed him his heart. And in the same way, the command showed what was lurking in Saul's heart. And what was it? You read the chapter. The command that God gave revealed the pride that was taking over Saul's heart. We see this in verse 12, 
where after his so-called victory over the Amalekites, says he went to Carmel and he set up a monument in his own honor. Huh. In honor of his victory. Maybe he called it Saul Tower. And we see his pride again in verse 17, where Samuel says a hard but true thing to him. He says, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? You were once small in your own eyes. Implication, you are no longer small in your own eyes. You now think you're a big cheese. It was pride. And God's command surfaced the pride in Saul's heart. How did it do? How, how so? Because he thought, I don't completely agree with God on that, so I'm just going to modify things. I'm going to change things. I'm not going to do exactly what he said. I'll do part of what he said because I actually think I know better than God. And that is the way in which God's command revealed his pride. And God's commands have a way of revealing what is in our hearts. I mean, let me speak as a husband. What is God's command to me as a husband? His main command is, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's God's command to me as a husband. You know what that command does to me? It shows me just how selfish I am. Because there are times when I just don't want to do that. I want to put me first, and that command says, don't do that. And, and, it, and it shows me, I sometimes think, you, you are so flippant selfish. The command brings it to light. Now, I'm not a wife, so I can't speak on the, on the flip side of that. But I have a sneaky suspicion that the command to wives to submit to your husband's leadership may also at times cause stuff to surface in wives that maybe you didn't know was there. That little attitude of, who are you to tell me what to do? You know, I'm my own person. You know, I live in Santon. Just saying. <laughs> what about God's command to pay taxes, to abide by the laws of the land, like the speed limit? His command regarding Christian stewardship or regular worship. Our attitude, those commands have a way of bringing our attitude to God to the surface. Third lesson. God will hold us accountable for our obedience to his commands. If we learn anything from this passage, we learn that God doesn't overlook or ignore our disobedience to his commands. He revealed the fact of Saul's disobedience to Samuel, who then went as God's representative to have that hard talk with Saul. With God's command in mind, destroy everything, Let's read from verse seven. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Huh? Okay, move on. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle and the fat calves and lambs and everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and not carried out my instructions. Verse 12, early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul but he was told, Saul has gone down to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. So Samuel follows him from Carmel to Gilgal. Verse 13, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I've carried out the instructions of the Lord. I mean, you can picture the scene. 
There is Saul, you know, basking in the glory of this victory. He's just set up Saul Tower as a monument to his own military prowess. And little old Samuel, remember we saw last week, old and gray. Little old Samuel, old and bald, I mean old and gray, comes shuffling up to him. And Saul, towering giant of a man that he is, he says, hey, Samuel, you know, good to see you. Guess what? I've carried out the command of the Lord, done and dusted the Amalekites of history. Huh. Verse 14, but Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? See, God didn't turn a blind eye, or maybe in this case a deaf ear, to Saul's disobedience. And Hebrews reminds us that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So God held Saul accountable. He confronted him for his disobedience. And this should serve as a warning to us. God always deals with sin, but he doesn't always deal with, deal with it swiftly as he dealt with Saul's. But he certainly, as the last verse in Ecclesiastes says, God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So every sin not covered by the blood of Christ will be uncovered in God's judgment. And then lesson number four, God will not settle for partial obedience to his commands. It's not foreign to sinful nature for us to think that God will accept partial obedience in lieu of complete or total obedience. Um, we think that if we do some of what God has said or even most of what God has said, that he'll kind of be okay with stuff that we, that we don't do. That he'll overlook those, those sins. The passage teaches us that from God's point of view, partial obedience is disobedience. Let me say that again. From God's point of view, partial obedience is disobedience. And we have to read the dramatic conversation to see this play out. Let's read from verse 13. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you, I've carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, verse 15, the soldiers brought them uh, from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we totally destroyed. Stop, says Samuel. Enough. I can imagine him putting his hands over his ears. You know, stop it. You know, stop bulldusting me. Come on. Stop. Let me tell you what the Lord told me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Can you just get this cocky attitude? Okay, tell me. What did the Lord have to say last night? Samuel said, verse 17, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them till you've wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. Huh? Listen to yourself. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. <laughs> so did you notice Saul tried to to justify his partial obedience by focusing on what he did do. 
It's as if he says, never mind the little stuff that I didn't do. Look what I did do. I did go on the mission. Aren't you satisfied with that? And then he blamed the soldiers. You know, the soldiers took the best of the sheep and the cattle. And then he puts a spiritual spin on it. And he says, they did that, Samuel, by the way, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Implication, you should be really pleased with that. We can easily fall into this, can't we? This partial obedience thing. Yeah. I'm sleeping with my girlfriend, but we're going to church. Yeah. We're in church every Sunday. Yeah. Um, I'm not totally above board with SARS, but I, but I am tithing. At least I, you know, only watch soft porn, not the hard stuff. So, it's okay. Listen to God's hard talk in verse 22. In response to Saul's spiritual justification of sparing the sheep and the cattle to offer a sacrifice to God, Samuel replies in these words, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Is the Lord so pleased with all your spiritual sacrifice when you're not obeying him? Is he pleased with my sacrifice if, there's a, if there are areas of disobedience where I'm saying, in effect, never mind you, I'm gonna do it my way. He goes on and says, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. In what way is rebellion like divination or witchcraft? The rebel worships himself or herself instead of God while the person involved in witchcraft or divination, worship Satan. So in effect, who are you worshiping? In the same way, arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. The arrogant person worships himself or herself. The idolater worships an idol. What's the difference? When we disobey God, we're guilty of the same sin. We may as well be involved in divination or we may as well be involved in idolatry, in idol worship. Now, what are the consequences for Saul of this partial obedience? Actually, his rebellion and idolatry, let's call it what it was. Look at verse 23. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, Samuel said to him, the Lord has rejected you as king. And the big lesson for you and for me, is that partial obedience is disobedience. And God will not accept partial obedience in lieu of obedience. And then one last lesson. God will not accept superficial repentance. When Saul heard those words from Samuel, the Lord has rejected you as king. He repented after a fashion. But his repentance was superficial, it was shallow, it was sham, it was just shot through with inconsistency. It wasn't acceptable to God. And there are three marks here of shallow or superficial repentance. Number one, superficial repentance continues to make excuses. Look at verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. Sounds like really good repentance, doesn't it? But then he goes on. I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. In essence, he was saying, they made me do it. You know, I was under pressure. How could I stand up against, you know, all the others around the boardroom table wanted to go this way. I mean, I couldn't just sort of be the only one who went the other way, for heaven's sake. That's what he's saying. 
I couldn't help it. Everybody else was doing it. But true repentance doesn't make excuses. True repentance says, I was wrong, full stop. Second characteristic of superficial repentance, it's more concerned about getting back into favor with others than getting right with God. And Saul wanted the favor of Samuel and the people more than he wanted the favor of God. So what did he do? So he says to Samuel, he's just heard this, you've been rejected as king. All the people are there, all the soldiers, the army that have just won this quote-unquote great victory. And he doesn't want to appear bad in their eyes. And so they know that Samuel has arrived on the scene. And so it's really important for his image, for the people to see that he and Samuel are tight and that everything's fine and that everything's cool. And so he says to Samuel, won't you, won't you come with me and let's offer a sacrifice and worship God? And Samuel says, no way. And he starts walking away or shuffling away. And you picture the scene. The scripture says, Saul grabbed a hold of his cloak and all Samuel just kept going. And part of his cloak was ripped off and left in Saul's hands. And Samuel spins around and he looks at him and he says, just as part of my coat has been turned off, so the kingdom has been torn away from you and it's going to be given to someone who's more worthy. And he was referring to David. And then Saul turns on the tears and he begs him and he says, no, please come with me. And for some strange reason, Samuel relents and he goes with him. Commentators have interesting speculation as to why. Probably the best answer I've read is that maybe they thought, maybe Samuel thought, look, this is for the sake of the stability of the nation at the moment, let's not make a big scene. Uh, God's going to uh, deal with Saul anyway, I don't know. But uh, so Samuel goes back with him and they go through the, the motions of that sacrifice. So God won't, well, another characteristic of superficial repentance is that it shows no grief in offending God. Samuel was grieved, he was heartbroken when God told him about Saul's disobedience. If you look back at verse 11, he was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night cried out, I'm sure, in anguish and anger and prayer before having this hard talk with Saul. And then if you glance down to verse 33, after Samuel goes his way and he never sees Saul again till the day of his death, it says, Samuel mourned for him. Samuel mourned for him. So Samuel was grieved. Verse 35, God was grieved. But Saul seems to have shown no grief. He was more concerned about what others would think about him than he was about the grief he had caused his God. He was more grieved that he had been caught out in his sin than he was about the sin itself. Now, as we think about repentance, like Saul... David would later on, and we get into 2 Samuel chapter 12, David would later on sin just as grievously as Saul did. You remember the Bathsheba incident, having her husband murdered, the lies, the deception, the adultery. David sinned terribly. And when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, David cried out, I have sinned against the Lord. Same words that Saul used here. And Nathan replied, the Lord has forgiven your sin. The Lord has taken away your sin and you will not die. What was the difference? The difference was that David was truly repentant. In Psalm 51, he said, he prayed, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you judge. That was the difference. No excuses, no blaming. 
I have sinned and I have sinned against you. You are right. I am wrong. Full stop. And the word from heaven comes in grace. The Lord has forgiven your sin. That is so, so, so amazing. And had Saul truly repented, he would have found the same mercy. The final scene of the chapter is a graphic one. And it shows old Samuel in his zeal for God's honor and justice, doing what Saul had been commanded to do but failed to do. Look at verse 32. Then Samuel said, Bring King Agag, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him confidently, thinking, Surely the bitterness of death is past. So here's Agag, he's probably shackled in chains, and they bring him, and he's thinking, Oh, I think I'm going to get off this one. I mean, what's this old dude going to do to me? Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel looks him straight in the eye and he says this, verse 33, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. I am a great fan of the NIV translation. That's the translation you've got in front of you. 2004 version, there's a new 2011 update. I love the NIV. But the NIV lets us down at this point because it sanitizes it to make it acceptable to modern ears. And this is where the ESV, the English Standard Version, is, a, I think, a more accurate translation. You know what the text actually says? It says that Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord. Ooh, that's not very polite. He hacked him to pieces before the Lord. Mm. This dramatic confrontation of a disobedient king by a broken-hearted prophet when you pull it together, it has one powerful message that we dare not miss. In all of our questions about the passage and all the stuff that we haven't had time to delve into that I've read in the commentaries, we mustn't miss this one thing. This passage teaches us that sin is serious. Does it not? That sin is serious. Today, reflecting on the horrors of Old Testament holy war, we must remember the reality of God's coming judgment that will be much, much worse than anything we have read in chapter 15. God is a holy God, and his fierce anger burns against uncleansed sin. In Revelation 19, 15, we learn that when Jesus returns in judgment, he will, quote, tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. God will always deal with sin the same way. He has not become more nice and more tolerant not a case of, well, that was the God of the Old Testament and now we have the God of the New Testament. Rubbish. He is the same eternal, unchanging God. Look at verse 29. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind for he, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. But this also means that God forgives sinners. But on what basis? On what basis can this holy God forgive sinners? Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter three. He says, there is no difference 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that there is no difference between me and Saul. There is no difference between you and Saul. I have not carried out the Lord's commands. I have given him partial obedience. I have justified my sin. And so have you. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Paul goes on, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him, Christ, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this, Paul says, to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance, he left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I think that is the most, one of the most amazing passages in the whole Bible. And the Lord's table, to which I'm about to invite you to come in a moment, bears witness to the justice of God in Jesus' sacrifice of atonement. Because of this, because of what Jesus did on the cross, and because of what this table speaks of, God can remain just and at the same time forgive guilty sinners like you and like me. This table, the bread that speaks of the broken body of Christ, the cup that speaks of the shed blood of Christ, this table tells us that sin is serious. It reinforces the message of this, of this passage. This table tells us that sin is serious. It tells us that God's justice is perfect, unbending, unbreakable. It tells us that God's love is absolutely mind-blowing. It tells us that Christ's sacrifice is enough. Is enough. And it tells us that he offers it to us freely by grace. All of us, souls, can come to Christ and be forgiven if we truly repent. That's what this table tells us. And that's why we come again and again, because we need to be reminded of that. And this table speaks to those of you this morning who've never come to Christ. And you think that if you've been more good than bad, God's going to accept that and you'll be fine. You think that you, like Saul, can say, look at what I've done. Even my few things I haven't done so well, but look what I have done. I've been a great husband. I've been a good father. I belong to Rotary. You know, look at what I've done. I've given to Rays of Hope, for heaven's sake. I mean, sure, I've done a few bad things, but I mean, who hasn't? You think like that, you're thinking just like Saul. And your end will be the same as his. But when you come like David and you say, I've sinned against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are right, I am wrong. Then God says, this is for you. This is for you. So as we come to the table, we come with this reminder that despite our sin, as the hymn writer says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. 
and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And once we've been cleansed in the blood of Christ, that fountain open for sin and uncleanness, then we can sing in the words of that, it is well with my soul. That wonderful verse says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. So we're going to come to the table. I invite you to come. If you know Christ, come with hearts that remember the seriousness of your sin, the justice of your God, the love of your God, the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice, and come and eat and give thanks. And if you don't yet know him, this is like a, an invitation that says, you're welcome, come, just as you are, come. Let's pray together. Oh God, our sins are great, but your mercy is even greater. Grace greater than all my sin. Thank you for the cross, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. And so we praise you. And as we come to this table, we come with broken hearts, but with thankful hearts. Give us your grace as we come. In Jesus' name, amen.